Well, good morning. It's, uh, we would like to welcome you to our worship service this morning. Um, if it's your first time, you're very welcome. Uh, I will just say, at the end of the service, there are refreshments. And please do just stay behind and, and get to know people. Um, I've got a notice about the refreshments in a moment. Uh, but before we, we get to that, I've got a few other notices first. There's a long list this morning, so you have to bear with us. After the notices, um, I'll pray and read a few verses from a psalm before we, we sing our first hymn. But just, just to go through the notices, uh, there's a, a reminder about the shoeboxes. If, if you want to do a shoebox for Operation Christmas Child, I think it's called, then there, there are shoeboxes in the foyer at the back. Please uh, take one and follow the, the, the sheet. You, you have a little sheet that says what to put in it, what not to put in it. And the deadline for those is the, the 14th of November. That week is the deadline for the collection. And, and so if you're interested in doing that, just think of the, of the joy that you could bring to a little child uh, if you filled on the, one of those boxes. Um, what a blessing that would be to some child um, who's, who's less fortunate than, than we are. Also, there's a reminder about the fellowship meal um, on the 20th of November. If, if you want to come to that, there's a, a sign-up sheet in the activity hall. And so please, please do sign up for that. I haven't actually been to one of them yet. It always seems to happen on a Sunday when I'm away. But um, I'm, I'm told they're very good. Chloe was there the last time without me, and she had a good time. So please do sign up for that. It's 20th of November. Um, tomorrow evening, you've... Uh, the, there is the glow party, or light party, and, and that's basically uh, for primary school children, where children can come and learn about how Jesus Christ is the light of the world. It's not celebrating Halloween, it's an alternative to Halloween. Instead of focusing on darkness, there's a focus on the light of, of Christ. And if you'd like uh, your child to come along to that, then please speak to Tiago. If Tiago is busy, at the end of the service, which I'm sure it will be, then speak to Chloe um, if you'd like your child to come. That's primary school children. Um, if, if you want them to come, then, then please uh, speak to them. Refreshments, as I mentioned at the start, please do stay behind for a cup of coffee, a cup of tea. But this time, there's, they're not over, over in the, the hall there. They're going to be either in the foyer or in the lounge. And that's because the activity room there is for the children to, 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 to blow off some steam after the service because the, the grass area outside is having some rest. It's having a Sabbath from the, the children playing on it. So, so, so please just, uh, that's set aside for the children after the service. Tea and coffee will be in the foyer at the back. I've got another reminder about the men's convention, which is uh, next Saturday. If you'd like to come to that, then uh, please speak to Dickie. There is one requirement, and that is that you're a man. And so if you are a man and you want to come to the convention, then please speak to Dickie. It's in Nottingham. There are lifts going from, from the church. Uh, so please speak to Dickie about that. And I've got one notice, personal one, before Tim Saw comes and just shares something with us briefly. And this is just to mention the Open Air Mission magazine. Uh, there's a new one out now. And I've, I've put some at the back in the foyer. There's a little table there with magazines on. And if you'd like one of the Open Air Mission magazines, please do pick one up. Um, I've, I've, I've written a little bit in this one. And I've, I've basically shared about what happened on the Birmingham week. So in the summer, we had a team event where a number of us went to Birmingham, did a week of open airs. And if you'd like to read a little bit about what happened during the week, then there's some people there that I spoke to and who you can pray for. And each of the workers shares a little bit about uh, what they've been doing. So if you'd like one of those to pray, then please just take one from the little table at the back. Now, Tim Saw is just going to come and uh, just share something with us. Not at this church, of course, but at other churches. I hear people complaining about the long list of notices at the beginning of the service. But you know what? A long list is a sign of life, which is great. No list, no life in the church. So here we go. Um, first of all, last time, this, this time last week I was here with a mop. I just want to report to you folks that on Saturday morning, yesterday morning, we had 25 people came into the church with their cleaning materials to clean the church from top to bottom. It was amazing. We had a good time. 
It was great to fellowship together, doing these jobs, and we all had a sense of achievement after all of that. So thank you, thank you so much to all those who turned out to do that, young and not so young. We had a real spread. It was great. If you feel left out now, having not taken part in that, there will be another opportunity in the spring. So please sign up for that, and uh, I can now put this down, because I've said something about that one. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is my next visual aid here which is the money course. You'll be aware, some of you, that from time to time we run the money course at this church, and the time has come to do it again. Now, the actual details of the time, dates and times are on the notice there, and also put a notice at the front of the church. Um, there will also be postcards that I'll be putting in the front with all the details on it, which you can collect from Tuesday onwards for any friends, neighbours who you think <coughs> might appreciate coming on the money course, which I shall tell you a little bit about it now. So the money course is run by Christians Against Poverty. Christians Against Poverty aims to help people practically with their finance, but also to draw them into a, into a building, into church, so that for some people it will be their first introduction to church. We do give a brief talk about what Jesus had to say about money, which is very important, but we aim to help them practically as well. The, money, the Christians Against Poverty, we now have an inside track on them, actually, because Ian, do you mind me saying this, Ian? <coughs> Too late, anyway, sorry. <laughs> uh, Ian has now started working full-time for Christians Against Poverty. So um, it's a great... Ian will tell you, having been there a week or two, that it's a good organisation and uh, they do great work. So they help people who are in severe debt, first of all. Um, but that's not what we're about. We're about the money course, which is helping those people who aren't necessarily in debt but would like a little more help to organise their finances and review their finances better. So... You don't have to divulge any information to Caroline and I who are running the course. Um, that's up to you to do. We give you three sessions in an evening, um, Wednesday, Tuesday the 15th, the 22nd and the 29th from 7.30 till 9. And we take you through various procedures for helping you with your finances, get you to think about it. And we also provide you with a book that helps you go home that week, do a bit of homework, think about your budgeting and then come back the next week and you keep the information private to you as much as you wish, or if you want to share some of it, you can do. And we also, if you have IT skills and you have an iPad or a laptop or a computer, we give you an absolutely brilliant software package, which is yours for life, where you can just go through the list of all the expenditures you might have in the coming year, fill in the boxes as to how much you think you're going to be spending on it, and then it automatically calculates how much money you'll have, if you're lucky, left over at the end of the month, or how much money you'll be in debt at the end of the month. And then we encourage you in different ways that you could perhaps adjust your budget to make it fit to your income. Um, we have a laugh. We do little activities that are quite good fun to do. It's entertaining, but also people who've been on it said it's brilliant. It's for young people who are just setting out in life, not university students. We run a separate course for them. It's for young couples who are just setting at home because there's so many uncertainties they need to think about. It's for families who've got children, um, how are we going to save up for those school trips? How are we going to save up for their university fees in years to come? And we help you plan for that and set apart savings, if you have enough to make any savings, that is, to, to plan for the future. If you are getting old, like Caroline and I, then I bet in your households you have one person who does the budgeting, who does, is in finance, control of finance. If that's you, that's all well and good. But, as I said to Caroline, one day, one of us will go before the other. And if the one that goes is in charge of the finances and knows all about the budgeting, you hear so many widows or, or people who've been left by their partners say, I haven't a clue what to do now. They did all of that. Well, it's an opportunity for you guys who are a little older like Carol and I to come together, to think through your finances, share the information and plan your budgeting together. And then you're both aware of how it works and what you're planning to do that year. And it saves arguments over money in the coming year, which is brilliant. So... Um, it's all free, there's no charge whatsoever, coffee and biscuits will be available, cards will be on the table on Wednesday. Do think now about any friends, neighbours, family members who you think might benefit from coming along, because they'll come to the church, it'll be great, but we'll also be able to help them practically as well. Thank you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you, Father, that we can draw boldly before the throne of grace this morning. 
because of the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that, that you do not deal with us as our sins deserve, but if, if Christ is our Savior, that you hear our prayers, you, you accept our worship, you are our Father and we are your children and we thank you for that. And Father, we just commit our time to you this morning and we pray, loving Father, that you will work among us by your Spirit, that you will work in our hearts. Father, that we will leave this morning with a greater love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we ask these things in his name. Amen. Just a few verses from Psalm 99 before we sing our first two hymns. Psalm 99 says this, The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. And then final verse, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill. For the Lord our God is holy. We're going to worship our holy God now with our first two hymns, after which Wendy will come and pray.
Good morning, everyone. I, uh, I just love it when the Lord does something interesting. And when uh, George was talking, he talked about Psalm 99, about holiness. So let us pray. The book of Revelations tells us that in heaven, the angels and heavenly creatures constantly call, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The Apostle Peter in his first letter reminds Christians, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with hearts full of wonder that the one who created and controls the vast universe should want to hear our prayers. And indeed, you are more concerned to hear us speaking to you, our God and our Saviour, than we are to come to you. Lord, we're very aware that we're sinners coming to a perfect God and to a Saviour in whom no fault could be found. We are as nothing in our own eyes, and it is such an amazing thing that you should, as your word tells us, lavish your love on us and that we should be called the children of God. Please enable us to come with hearts which are humble and repentant and as little children coming to our glorious Father with our sins washed clean by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus and our hearts open to listen and hear your word speaking to us as individuals and as your church gathered here in Walton. Lord God, we want to hear your voice speaking to us today, teaching us your will and helping us by your Holy Spirit to live as children of our Heavenly Father with pure hearts and minds and with a deep desire to be bold and enabled to spread your gospel throughout our neighbourhood, our town and our country and indeed through supporting your people in other lands, enabling the whole world to be full of the good news of your kingdom. So we pray for those who teach us at our church, for Andy and Tiago and others who bring your truth to us. Will you enable them to understand what you want us to know and may we be obedient to your messages to us. We thank you for our leadership team and all who serve you here. Please help them in their work for you. We pray for those who go onto the streets and into schools as George and Chloe do and for those who've left families and friends to travel abroad with your message of salvation as David and Agnieszka and Ed and Katie and many others <coughs> have done who are known to us individually. We pray too for Igal and his wife Milana in Israel and Jen and Richard in Mali and for the team at Pine Lake. Please protect them and grant them all the joy of seeing many come to know you, Lord. We thank you for them all. Please help us to be faithful in our prayers and our support for them. We thank you too for those who faithfully ministered your word to us here in the past. We ask that you will bless them richly and guide them in all that they do. Father, we also come to ask you to thank you for the wonderful miracles we see which have come from your love and your grace, especially for those who are finding you to be their Saviour and Lord. We thank you for those who are much better following periods of ill health or operations and for those who are finding you to be a real help in times of need. We pray too for those who are awaiting operations or treatment and for those whose lives are very difficult during this time. Father, please show us how each of us can help in many and different ways. Please enable us to really have a love for each other in this fellowship and for those amongst whom you have placed us. <coughs> Lord God, we pray for those of our families and friends who do not know you. We long that you would open their eyes to see you as you are, and that they would respond to your mercy, love and grace. <coughs> we thank you for the many times we can meet and enjoy fellowship and ministry. We ask that you will give us a real desire to study and learn your word, that it might be hidden in our hearts and make us wise, and guide us into the way of truth, that we may not fall into sin. We pray your help for the various children's and young people's activities, which start again after the half term. We pray your blessings on the Knit and Natural and the Let's Create groups, 
for the football group, for the Pebbles Toddlers session, and the way meeting for folk with learning difficulties next Sunday. Please use these activities to encourage those we meet to come to faith in you. Lord, we bring to you all that we do in your name and ask that you will enable us to speak clearly and with wisdom and understanding so that we may honour you and give you the praise which is due to your name. We ask these prayers in your name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're going to sing our children's song now, which is God Says Light and Heavens Burn. And after this, uh, Sarah will come and read to us from the Word of God. We've got the morning off, some actions. So we don't have any for this one. So all the more reason to sing with some gusto. Today's reading is from uh, the book of Acts, starting chapter 21, verse 40. Having received the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defence. When they heard him speak to him in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. Under Gamaliel, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers, and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. 
I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as also the high priest and all the council can testify. I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus, because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you've seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and heard the Lord, saw the Lord speaking. Quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him, he's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship. But I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to question him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realised he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. The next day, since the commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, You dare to insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledged them all. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously, we find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. The next morning, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. 
Centurion said, Paul, the prisoner, sent me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, What is it you want to tell me? He said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them, because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man and cautioned him, Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide mounts for Paul so he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. We're going to sing our next hymn, which is Jesus I my cross have taken. And after this, uh, Andy's going to come and preach to us from the, the scriptures we've just had read. If you uh, have children in the SAS, kind of Sunday school age group, um, then uh, if they haven't left already, then uh, that facility is available. Just go out the back and we'll try not to look at you. Um, We're going to be looking at a very large chunk of the book of Acts this morning. 
uh, we are basically going to cover all of Paul's time in Jerusalem, all in one go. Uh, So I'm going to pray that the Lord will help us as we do that. Let's pray now. Father, you know the the state of every heart of, of every one of us here gathered this morning. And Father, with your living word, we pray that you would apply it to each and every heart. That those of us who need to be rebuked, we would feel that rebuke this morning. But those of us, Lord, who are fragile, those of us who are discouraged, Lord, that we would feel your encouragement this morning. Father, help us, we pray. Help us to take to heart these words that we look at together. Speak to us, we pray. Amen. Well, now, there can be little doubt that Billy Graham was a man who was mightily used by God. He died a few years back. But he was a bold and courageous man who, who over decades of ministry, preached the gospel in person to over 100 million people. That's quite an achievement, isn't it? So we're not talking about the broadcasts covering way more than that. In person, face to face, with 100 million people. Uh, it's hard to imagine a more fearless preacher if you ever watched him. I'd recommend you do. It is it's quite an education to watch this man preaching. And interestingly, at the height of his powers, this, this great mighty man, uh, it was announced that he would be coming to speak at Cambridge University. And that provoked a response from one particular clergyman who wrote to the Times saying that Billy Graham's approach would be, I quote, unthinkable before a university audience of Cambridge, to say the least. It would be laughed out of court. Uh, Now, those comments, uh, they became quite well known, and they played on Billy's insecurities. Actually, one biographer comments, Graham, ever insecure about his lack of advanced theological education, dreaded the meetings and feared that a poor showing might do serious harm to his ministry and affect which way the tide will turn in Britain. Had he been able to do so with a complete loss of face, without a complete loss of face, he would have cancelled the meetings or persuaded some better qualified man to replace him. Billy wrote to his friend John Stott, telling him, I do not know that I've ever felt more inadequate and totally unprepared for a mission. As I think over the possibility for messages, I realise how shallow and weak my presentations are. In fact, I was so overwhelmed with my unpreparedness that I almost decided to cancel my appearance. But because plans had gone so far, that I thought it was perhaps best to go through with it. However, it is my prayer that I shall come in the demonstration and power of the Holy Spirit. You know, it, reading something like that serves as a good reminder, doesn't it, that even the boldest of us is still human. We're still human. With all the, the weaknesses, all the insecurities that go with just being ordinary people. Now, I don't know about you, but I tend to think of the Apostle Paul. <laughs> you know, if Billy Graham's here, the Apostle Paul's up there, isn't he? You read his, his life, he's even bolder. Even more courageous when you read what he does. Surely Paul never felt insecure, un- unsure about himself. Surely he was never discouraged or afraid. But actually then after a moment of thought, you, you think to yourself, well, yeah, of course we know he was. There's passages in the New Testament itself that suggest that Paul may not have, in fact, been naturally bold a naturally sort of irrepressible person that you sort of tend to assume he is in and of himself. Uh, And look at some of these. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, for example, Paul admits to the church there in Corinth, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. He's talking literally, isn't he? Imagine Paul trembling. And 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, Paul acknowledges that his reputation amongst the church, he knows what people are saying about him, is that his letters are weighty, and forceful, but in person, he's unimpressive, and his speaking amounts to nothing. Paul then asks the churches in the province of Asia that they would, he writes this in Ephesians chapter 6, pray for me, for whenever I open my mouth, the words will be given me that I may fiercely make, make known the mysteries of the gospel, for which I'm an ambassador in change. 
Pray I may declare it fearlessly as I should. He's worried, isn't it? And, and we've seen, haven't we, as going through the book of Acts, at least two occasions the Lord has had to come to Paul and say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. When he's in the middle of, of conflict and, and opposition. Did Paul ever get discouraged? Well, a quick survey, just one letter. I think I find this really striking. One letter that he wrote to a young man, Timothy, finds all of these statements. Look at these. This is just one short letter. He says, you know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phlegius and Homo Homogenes. Demas, because he loved the world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. At my first offence, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. Do you think Paul felt deserted? <laughs> Discouraged? Was Paul superhuman? No, he was just like us. Probably more so than we imagine, actually. So just imagine how he was feeling after everything that had happened to him in Jerusalem. That's where we are as we look at our text this morning. Just to recap, if you were with us uh, last week, you'll know that Paul has arrived in the city and at the suggestion of the church elders of the church in Jerusalem, he purifies himself and then he heads over to the temple to demonstrate to everybody in the city that actually, do you know what? He has not rejected the law of Moses, that all the rumours about him doing so are unjustified. But whilst he's in the temple itself, he's spotted by some former enemies. These are Jews from the province of Asia where he had all that trouble. And they whip up the crowd into a riot. They throw out false accusations saying, here's the one who teaches against everything that we stand for. And here's, look at him, he's even brought Greeks into the temple, which he hadn't. And the crowd goes mad. You know, the, the crowds in Jerusalem, they just seem to be like this, don't they? Any, you know, encouragement to riot, and they're there. Paul is beaten severely. They just love to show their, their, their zeal, didn't they? Their religious zeal. He's beaten severely and dragged from the temple grounds. Uh, and they take him out of the temple simply just so they can finish the job. But in the nick of time, this is our cliffhanger last week, wasn't it? The, temp the, 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 the Roman guards, they arrive, they grab him, they manhandle him up the crowd, they sort of carry him over their heads, I guess, up the steps of the barracks. And now he stands on the steps of the Roman barracks just outside the temple. The crowds are baying for his blood. He manages to explain to the Roman commander, commander that, uh, who he is, uh, and the Roman commander allows him to address the crowds. That's where we are now. And so the first scene that we see, that we've just had read to us, we see Paul talking to this crowd and trying to get them to see reason. It may well be, actually, that, he was, it, that it wasn't only the commander, you see, who has no idea who Paul is or what is going on. It may be that that's actually also true of this mob. They just like to have a nice little riot. Some of them might have been there just because, you know, they, they like to be there when someone's getting a good kicking. I don't know if you've ever, ever been to a country where that sort of thing happens. It's frightening, the number of people that just want to get involved in doing something violent to somebody else, if there's any justification. But as soon as Paul addresses this wild bunch of people in Aramaic, well, there's, that, you know, there's silence. This is their mother tongue. Now, what Paul says next over the silence of this crowd is striking in its clarity, actually, and in its power. Have a look at what Paul is saying here. He starts by telling them who he is. This is the beginning of chapter 2, chapter 22, sorry. He's telling them, he tells them, first of all, look, I am a thoroughbred Jew, born in a Jewish home, raised in Jerusalem itself. You don't get to be more thoroughbred than that. Not only that, I, he's completed his higher education under the tutelage of the great and respected teacher Gamaliel, a leading authority in the Sanhedrin. Actually, the, the grandson of the famous Rabbi Hillel himself. Now, that may mean nothing to you, but it's impressive. This is impressive stuff, trust me. And then he reassures the crowd that with such credentials, 
they can be absolutely certain, can't they, that he's every bit as zealous for God as any man standing before him. So what happened? Well, he goes on to tell them he was on a mission to destroy the church in Damascus, these followers of the way, when he encountered Jesus of Nazareth. We know his testimony, don't we? It's a wonderful testimony. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he is struck blind. His whole world came crashing down. It's interesting, isn't it? It is possible for the brightest, the most intelligent, the most educated person to be completely wrong. That's what Paul discovered. To have his life turned upside down. Why are you persecuting me? He thought he was zealously serving God. But God himself confronts him on that road, strikes him blind, and tells him that he's actually persecuting the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Well, how do we know that Paul hadn't gone mad? That this wasn't some just crazy, like Paul's had some kind of a stroke? Well, he goes on to tell them, Ananias, a well-known, respected Jew in Damascus, confirms the Lord's calling on his life opens the eyes of the blind, that's something only God can do, opens the eyes of this blind man and tells him that God has called him to witness to all men. I I gather there'd be some rumblings in the crowd at this point. But Paul goes on with this story. He returned to Jerusalem and it was there, back in Jerusalem, in the temple itself, look, that he was praying to the Lord and the Lord appeared to him again and commissioned him to go to be his missionary to the Gentiles. That's the gist of really what he says to this crowd. I don't know about you, but I thought that's a pretty compelling message, isn't it? If you knew Paul. The big clear point of this whole presentation here is actually Paul never asked for any of this. None of it was Paul's idea. If you look through it, through the whole of his, uh, his testimony here, none of his idea. What he was doing, he was, see, he was doing what he thought was right from the beginning, destroying the church. That's what Paul wanted to do. But God pulled the plug on all of that. God turned him around. God sent him off in the opposite direction. And what other explanation could you give for a successful, high-flying Jewish zealot recognized and respected in the Jewish community to do a 180-degree turn? What other reason than that God himself had turned him around? He himself, his life, is a powerful testimony to the gospel. I wonder if you've ever thought about that. Why would a man like Paul do this, put himself through this? Well, the crowd are not having any of it. It seems to make no impact on them at all, doesn't it? What actually triggers the crowd about what Paul says? Well, it's two statements, I think. It's statement, first of all, in verse 18, look, that God has told Paul that the Jews in Jerusalem are going to reject his testimony about Christ, that they're just God-rejectors. And second of all, in verse 21, that God has instead chosen the Gentiles, to send Paul to. It's very similar to what happened to Jesus, actually, in his hometown in Nazareth. Do you know that story? Jesus stood before the members of his own hometown, people from his own hometown, and pointed out that during the days of Elijah, the great prophet, God sent his servant to look after a Gentile widow and to heal a Gentile leper. And he says to them, is it because there weren't any widows or lepers in Israel? No, 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 no. God sent them there rather than to anyone in Israel, because Israel was a nation that had rejected the word of the Lord, just as these people before Paul, just as the people before Jesus. When Jesus says this to that that group in Nazareth, they want to throw him off a cliff. And Paul is pointing out the same things. That these people are rejecting God's saviour because of their own deep-seated prejudices. And actually, that's exactly what Paul had done earlier in his life. They will not accept a God that doesn't fit into the mould that they've got for God. 
I think that attitude is still alive and well today, don't you? People who reject God because he just doesn't fit with what they think God should be like. So many people struggle to accept the idea that God would send a saviour to save sinners, actually to save sinners. That's an offence to our world, isn't it? Surely, as we often hear it bandied about, God helps those who help themselves. That's what people think, isn't it? Surely we need to prove ourselves worthy of heaven if we're going to go there. Surely there's no hope at all for people worse than me. Yeah? For murderers, for rapists, for paedophiles. No hope for them, surely. Surely I am not as bad as they are, and therefore that is where I will rest my hope. I'm not as bad as other people. But Jesus simply says, he takes that all apart, he says this, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, it is the sick. Do you see the logic? Jesus says, I have not come to call the righteous, I've come to call sinners. Jesus came to save sinners. Jesus breaks all preconceived ideas of what God's saviour should be like, who God should save. The crowds cannot accept a God who is not impressed by all of their zealous efforts, their ethnic heritage, their religious credentials, you name it, whatever it is, a God who instead is interested in saving unclean, sinful people like Gentiles. As far as they are concerned, verse 22, they want the earth rid of Paul and anyone like Paul. He's not fit to live, they say. Well, that's our first scene. You see it in Jerusalem? The commander sees trouble brewing again, and he pulls Paul back into the barracks. Obviously, that whole interaction hasn't helped the commander, you see, because it's all been in, happening in Aramaic. So what does the commander now need to do? He needs to find out what's going on. He orders that there to be an interrogation of Paul by flogging. Now, flogging was an activity that people didn't, you, didn't always survive. It was so severe. And as they're stretching Paul out, we read that Paul plays his Roman citizen card. It's sort of, you know, as, as his back is bared and he's stretched over, ready to, uh, for, the, for the whipping. It's, excuse me, is this actually legal? I'm Roman. There is no way they want to be whipping a confession out of a Roman citizen. And so this sets the cat amongst the pigeons, doesn't it? Because Paul even outranks the commander as a Roman citizen, we find out later. The commander's a foreigner who's purchased his citizenship through a bribe, but the very man in charge of all of these soldiers is a man who, uh, who, who's... who's um, trying to whip a man who's, who's born into Roman citizenship and all the privileges. So it's a close call there. But things don't really impro improve for Paul as we go on into the 23rd chapter of Acts. Paul has a chance now to stand before the Sanhedrin. And it all seems to go wrong there too. He starts by standing in front of them and stating that in everything that he has done, he has done it with a clear conscience. And as he says this, under the accusation of wanting to go to the Gentiles, he receives a punch in the face for it. Now, I take it that actually what happens here is that Paul reacts to this, and, and possibly not in the best way that he could do. He calls out at whoever has given the order to strike him in the face that they are a whitewashed wall I think that's basically a way of saying you're a, basically you're a hypocrite. Yeah, you're a dirty wall that's got a white coating on it. And God is going to strike you, he says. It's been an unjust act. But unbeknownst to Paul, that order has come from the high priest, Ananias. And at this point, even an apology isn't going to put things right. People argue about what's happened here. Possibly, we know, we know Paul's eyesight wasn't very, very good. Uh, maybe he just couldn't tell where this voice was coming from. But it seems there's very little Paul can do to put the situation right at this point. Instead, Paul opts for creating a division. He knows that the Sanhedrin is a, a mix of Pharisees and Sadducees, two different religious parties. 
And as verse 8 tells us, the Pharisees believe in the supernatural, Sadducees do not. So he truthfully declares to them that actually all these charges are really to do with him being a Pharisee, uh, and he's been put on trial because of his hope in the resurrection of the dead. Well, the ensuing argument, you think it's very easy to get religious factions to argue, isn't it? The ensuing argument is so rough that, again, the commander must pull him out to stop him being torn to pieces. Well, the next day starts with a plot in Jerusalem. If you have a look at that next last section we looked at there, 40 men, we're told, swear an oath that they're not going to eat or drink anything until Paul is dead. It'd be very interesting to know if any of them kept that oath. Shockingly, the chief priests, the elders, the leaders of the people are actually in on the plot as well. They make plans to summon Paul for further questions. That's a legitimate thing to do, isn't it? And how can they be blamed if something unfortunate was to happen to sort to Paul on the way there? But by God's providence, Paul's nephew hears about the plot, gets word to the commander, and, he out, and the commander outwits the Jews by arranging for nearly 500 soldiers and cavalry to escort Paul north to Caesarea that very night. Okay, that's a, a sweeping through the chapter because we've got a lot to cover here. But I want you to get a feel for the kind of day that Paul has had. I mean, this has been, I think, barely 48 hours in Jerusalem and all of this stuff has happened to Paul. Passed from pillar to post, roughed up, beaten, threatened. I mean, he's been beaten by a mob. He's been rioted against. He's been nearly flogged. He's been punched in the face, <laughs> roughed up by clergy, in actual fact, and he's, uh, he's escaped a plot on his life. All of that has happened within 48 hours or so for Paul. And I've thought about this, and I made a few observations. Let me share them with you. First of all, I think that all the way through all of this happening to Paul here in Jerusalem, Paul's heart has stayed the same. He has been desperately desiring to see his enemies saved, his enemies turned around. His heart is breaking for them. He's not full of anger. He didn't need to address that crowd from the barracks. But I think that in them, Paul saw himself. For the grace of God, but for the grace of God, he would be amongst those very people. I'd suggest to you that actually maybe even he would have been the leader of those people. But his heart had been changed. I think that's what made Paul su such a mighty instrument in God's hands, a mighty instrument for the gospel. He says as much, really, to, to the Christians in Rome. Have a listen to this from Romans 9 and Romans 10. This is Paul sharing his heart. He says, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race. Chapter 10, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for the Israelites that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. I mean, isn't, this, isn't this a true thing? That it's only when we really understand what God has done for us, when we grasp actually the depths of our own sin, brothers and sisters, the utter depravity within us, the rampant idolatry in us, how we just go after anything and everything but God, that's our inclination. When we grasp what he has saved us from, when we appreciate the total necessity of his grace, that we've got nothing to bring to the table before God, nothing at all to contribute from ourselves, it's only then that we will be a mighty instrument 
in our Redeemer's hands. I hope you realise that. That's the first thing I think, is just seeing Paul's heart here. He knows where he's come from. It breaks his heart for those who are as he once was. The second thing I want you to see here is I think there's something actually very human, very ordinary about Paul, even amongst all of these extraordinary events that happen in this chapter. Despite his best efforts and all of his good intentions, neither of his appeals, nothing that he says really here, both to the crowds at the temple or to the Sanhedrin themselves, compelling though his message might be, powerful though his testimony might be, none of it seems to have made the blindest bit of difference to those that he's talking to. I find that very ordinary, very expected. Both attempts have been complete failures, at least from all human perspectives. I mean, we don't know what maybe happened further down the road, sure. But really, all that Luke is telling us here is this has just ended badly. It's discouraging, isn't it? By the end of his short stay in Jerusalem, Paul is, is bloodied and beaten and discouraged. He's low, isn't he? He's been laid low here. I wonder if you've ever been there. And why do I say he's discouraged? Well, I want to finish up this morning, really, by pulling out a single verse that I think shines like a gem amidst all the terrifying gloom that's happened in this city. So please, just, just pay attention to this verse. It's verse 11 of chapter 23. Just after Paul's brush with the Sanhedrin, he's returned to his cell, and we read this. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Paul's been returned to the barracks. He's sore. He's deflated. But in his holding cell, right there with him, stands the Lord. It's just something, isn't it? And he greets Paul with one word. Courage. How will Paul, how will this ordinary man, this ordinary disciple, just like you and me, how will he find courage to stand for Christ in this kind of adversity? Well, three things I want you to see. Courage is found first in the Lord's company, second in the Lord's command, and third in the Lord's call. Let's look at these very, very briefly. The Lord is found, is found in the Lord's company. The Lord stood near Paul. I mean, doesn't that make all the difference? To know that the Lord stands near us. Author Kevin DeYoung makes an important uh, observation on this point. Let me just read it out, what he says. He says, unless we spend time with Jesus, we will not speak of him clearly. We will not speak of him loudly. We will not let goods and kindred go this mortal life also. We will not have the truth abiding in us and exploding out of us. The more time you spend immersed in sports, the more time you spend immersed in politics, the more time you spend immersed in whatever your hobby, the more clearly you speak on that issue. You get bolder about those things. You see more. You understand more. So you speak more. That's good. But what about your courage with the gospel? What about your clarity with the things that matter most? You will not be bold to speak of Jesus unless you spend time with Jesus. Courage comes out of communion. But there's another aspect to this. See, I, now I don't do sports illustrations, that's not me. But imagine our little football team, that's about my level, our little football team for... Um, for Walton Evangelical Church, we've got a little team, I don't know if you know that, but imagine them playing against Homegate, the arch enemy, obviously, uh, and our lads are taking a beating. I mean, they are getting whipped, they're getting spanked. It's 8-0 at half time, and they're thoroughly discouraged. Can you picture the boys? Then David Craig reveals his secret weapon at half time. He's called in a favour, he's pulled some strings, and he's going to be subbing in Ronaldo at the beginning of the second half. I hear he's pretty good, right? What does that do to morale? Now, I'm arguing from the lesser to the greater here. With Jesus on our side, with Jesus with us, 
ours will always be the winning side. I mean, how Paul's heart must have been lifted that night as he feels a closeness with Jesus, the closeness of the Lord, who says actually to all of his disciples, surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. If you want to be courageous for Christ, you must spend time with him. You must know, you must remember, he's always with you. Courage is found in his company. Courage is also found, secondly, in his command. There is only one command, actually, in this verse. One imperative. It's a single word. Courage. You can be sure it's precisely the word Paul needs to hear from his Lord at that very moment. In the darkness of that cell. What does Paul hear? I'm with you, Paul. I'm here. Courage now. There's something very fortifying from knowing that what you've done, what you've been through, what you've experienced is exactly what the Lord wanted for you, what he wanted you to do. Not only that, but actually the message goes on, doesn't it? That all he requires of Paul is just more of the same. Just keep going, Paul. Take courage. As you've testified about me in Jerusalem, says Jesus, so you must testify in Rome. You've done it right, Paul. Just do more. I'm here. Take courage. You're running well. Keep going. Courage is found in God's command. Courage is also found in his call. What is it that the Lord has called Paul to do? It's the same thing that he's called us to do. And notice the words there. It is not to convert. It is simply to testify. To be a witness. To be ready to stand up and to simply say what you know. I wonder if some people just don't get that, really. I know there's some of you here who feel that you just, you really don't have the expertise. You don't have the know-how, the exhaustive knowledge you think you need, the sharpness of wits, the ability to think on your feet that would enable you to talk to others and tell them about what you believe. But that simply isn't true, brothers and sisters. If all of us waited until we thought we knew enough to answer every question, none of us would ever talk to anyone about our faith. Witnessing is about telling others what you do know, not what you don't know. It's about telling others what Christ has done for you. And that's something you know better than anyone else. That is what Christ's disciples are called to do. That's what Paul does here, isn't it? When we obey that call, there's nothing to fear. He is with us. So may we then know the presence of Christ with us. May we hear that whisper in our ear, courage. And may we follow his call to testify about what he has done for us. Let's pray. Father, help us, we pray. We want to follow this example laid out for us in scriptures, but we know that we are timid and we are weak. But you've not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and of self-discipline. Help us to spend time with you, to know you better, that we might speak of you more boldly. That we might tell others about what you have done for sinners such as us. Help us in this, Father. Give us courage. For we ask it in the good name of our, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're going to sing our final hymn as we bring our, our time to a close. And our final hymn is There is a Hope. And we'll, we'll stand to sing.
Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. 